Hello everyone! Welcome to this tutorial where we will explain step by step the concept of attributable risk in the medical decision making scenario. The usual outputs of clinical studies to determine the risk of suffering a disease are the relative risk estimators, that is, a number that establishes to what extent an exposure to a risk factor increases the probability of developing the disease in comparison to the absence of the exposure. These estimators are the relative risk, generally referred to as double R, the odds radio, or OR, and the hazard radio, or HR, which for practical purposes are interpreted in the same way. What are these risk estimators for? What are the scenarios where this information contributes to the decision-making process? Knowing the way that the risk of suffering a disease is determined is useful in two medical scenarios. The first has to do with public policy decisions that affect the population, a territory of epidemiology. The second are clinical scenarios, and as we will see in the next unit, it is related with the determination of the pre-test probability, the risk of disease before performing a diagnostic test. For now, we will refer to the first of these scenarios. The next one will be addressed in the next unit, for which we will use two examples. Example number one. Let's imagine a study, in fact there are many of them, where we want to determine the role of smoking in the risk of developing lung cancer. For this, a prospective court study is carried out, based on a population free of lung cancer but part of it exposed to the risk factor, that is, they are smokers. As we have seen in the previous sections of this course, we can calculate the incidence or new cases of lung cancer in both populations, exposed and unexposed. In this example, a total of 100,000 people were studied. 15,000 of them, or 15%, were smokers. In this group, 1,350 cases of lung cancer were found, that's a 9% incidence, while in the 85,000 people who did not smoke, only 680 cases were found, an incidence of 0.8%. With this data, we can say that the relative risk for lung cancer in smokers is 11.25 compared to non-smokers. We can interpret this as it is 11 times more likely for lung cancer to occur in smokers. This is undoubtedly a very high double R that leaves no question to establish a causal relationship between smoking and developing lung cancer. From a clinical pathophysiological point of view, the relative risk measure is very important to establish a cause-effect association. But what is the use of people knowing this? When a person knows this, he may decide to quit smoking. And if many people do, the mortality of lung cancer, one of the leading causes of death in adults, may decrease. But it is not easy to quit smoking, or never do it at all. And for this, programs and strategies aimed at the population are required. So the big question that could be asked by those responsible for carrying out and paying for these programs would be how many cases of lung cancer are attributable to smoking? In other words, how many cases of lung cancer would be avoided if people quit smoking? This is called the Attributable Population Risk or APR. The APR takes into account not so much the double R, but the absolute difference in risk. Instead of dividing the incidences of exposed and unexposed populations, a subtraction is made. In this case, the result is 8.2% or 0.082 measured as probability. This means that there is an 8.2% excess risk produced by smoking. If we calculate the inverse of 0.082, which is 12.1, we obtain a very intuitive measure called number needed to treat, or NNT.
that is interpreted as for every 12 person who do not smoke, an additional case of lung cancer in the population would be avoided. For every 100 people who did not smoke, 8 cases would be avoided. The next thing we should know is how many people smoked in the population study. In our example, there were a total of 15,000 smokers. If we apply the NNT, we will see that if those people had no smoke at all, we would have had 1,230 fewer cases. That is, 120 cases would have occurred anyway. This represents the 65% of the total cases. This is the APR. The APR can be calculated directly with a formula, using the prevalence of the risk factor in the population and the double R. Example number 2. In the previous example, data from a court study was used. How is the APR calculated in a case control study? The previously formula can also be used if we know the prevalence of the exposure in the control group, as long as the controls have been randomly extracted from the population, and the corresponding OR. Taking as an example the article reviewed in the previous activity, we can calculate the APR. Table 2 contains the data we need. On one hand, the prevalence of persisting prediabetes in the cases group was 40.6% and the adjusted OR was 2.62. Substituting in the formula, we obtain an APR of 39.6. This is interpreted as almost 40% of cases of myocardial infarction or cerebrovascular events are attributable to persisting prediabetes. In other words, if the risk factor were removed, that is, people did not become prediabetic or return to normal glycemia, a little less than half of all cases in the population could be avoided. The same formula can be applied to studies where the outcome is a time-to-event variable and where the estimator is a hazard radio. There are also formulas to calculate the confidence intervals for the APR. It should be mentioned that the sum of the APRs of all risk factors related to a disease usually leads to a total of more than 100%, which is counterintuitive. This is due to the large number of modular, mediating, and confounding factors that make interaction in the population. It is important to point out the importance of relationship between relative risk, population attributable risk, and the prevalence of the risk factor in the population. Let's take as an example the association between lung cancer and radon gas exposure. The odds radio estimated is 20. That is, it is 20 times more likely for lung cancer to appear when there is an exposure to high doses of radon about 20 PCI per liter, compared to the 0.4 dose. It is a huge OR that leaves no doubt about the causal relationship. It is a greater measure of relative risk than the one of tobacco, which is close to 10. However, in this graph, we can observe the importance of the prevalence of the risk factor to assign the population's attributable risk. When there is a high prevalence, as in the case of smoking that occurs in up to 20% of the population, the associated APR will be high. That is, a large portion of cases in the population will be attributable to smoking, while exposure to high doses of radon is lower, between 1-5% to depending on the geographical area. Therefore, the APR attributable to smoking is 65%, and the one attributable to radon is 17 percent. In general, it is important to distinguish scenarios where although there is a high relative risk, the APR will be low given the low prevalence of the factor in the population. In these scenarios, expensive strategies to prevent the disease may not be justified since only a few cases will be prevented. Otherwise, in spite of the fact that the relative risk is not so high, the high prevalence of the risk factor justifies measures to avoid it in the population.
Thank you for watching this tutorial and see you next time.